At the end of the seventeenth century, Peter the Great scoured Europe for scientists, craftsmen, and productive talent of all kinds to be brought to Russia to try to develop the economic and military strength of the empire. The first industries in Russia were founded by foreigners in the seventeenth century. The skilled labor used in these early industries, like their management, came from abroad. A whole colony of foreign craftsmen existed in St. Petersburg in the eighteenth century and in the Ukraine in the early nineteenth century, in addition to shopkeepers and money-lenders from India who operated in the province of Astrakhan. Armenian immigrants accounted for forty percent of all exports and fifty-three percent of all imports through Astrakhan in the mid-eighteenth century. Of two hundred fifty cotton-cloth factories there at that time, two hundred nine were owned by Armenians, who also owned thirty-two out of thirty-eight silk-weaving enterprises. From an early period, much of the economic and cultural development of Russia and its empire was a result of the importation of foreign knowledge and skills. Much of the Kremlin itself was built by an Italian architect. The Bering Sea, between Siberia and Alaska, was discovered by a Danish sea captain employed by the Russian government. Foreigners played a pioneering role in metallurgy, machine construction, and even government service in Tsarist Russia. These foreigners included both sojourners and permanent settlers, individual entrepreneurs and whole groups, such as the German farmers who settled in colonies on the Volga and the Black Sea in the 18th century. The Tsars themselves were of predominantly German ancestry. Catherine the Great was a German princess before marrying the Russian prince who became Tsar Peter III, whom she succeeded to the throne. Many of her male descendants later married women of German ancestry, creating a predominantly German line of czars. This was only part of a larger picture of a general cultural westernization of the Russian upper classes, which included their speaking French and being familiar with the literature, manners, and social thought of Western Europe. Such cosmopolitanism, however, further widened the cultural gap between the Russian elites and masses. Because of the huge size and large population of the Russian Empire, even modest economic progress, in particular sectors, could translate into vast quantities of output in absolute terms. Thus, by the early 18th century, Russia had the largest output of pig iron in Europe, though it lagged far behind Western Europe in the efficiency with which that pig iron was produced. In the middle of the 19th century, Russia produced more yarn than Germany. Nevertheless, as Russia advanced economically, the key roles in that advancement were played by foreign entrepreneurs, and, to a considerable but lesser extent, by foreign capital. The first woolen mill in Russia was erected by the Dutch. The mining and processing of both iron and copper in Russia owed their beginnings to German and Dutch mining engineers. The oil fields of the Caucasus were developed by the English and the Swedes. The greatest era of industrialization in Tsarist Russia began in the 1890s and continued until the First World War. Even this late in Russian history, foreigners remained a dominant factor, supplemented by the work of domestic minorities, such as the Jews, the Baltic Germans, and educated Poles. From 1885 to 1913, the annual growth rate of Russian industrial production averaged nearly 6%. For the period from 1860 to 1913, Russia's industrial growth rate exceeded that of Britain, France, or Germany, and was comparable to that of the United States. However, the level of industrialization at which it started and ended was not as high as in Western Europe or the United States. Nevertheless, it was an impressive performance, and the 1913 level of output would not be reached again under the Communists during the next decade. Most Russian international trade had historically been carried in foreign ships, and that remained so during the era of industrialization under the Tsars. Only 3% of Russian international shipping was in Russian vessels. In petroleum, nearly three-quarters of all invested capital in Russia was British capital. By 1899, at least 60% of all coal in Russia was produced by foreign companies. Nearly all electrical streetcars were Belgian. On the eve of the First World War, approximately one-third of the sugar mills in the country belonged to Jews, and these mills produced just over half the refined sugar in Russia. At about the same time, the second, fourth, and fifth largest producers of agricultural machinery in Russia were all British firms, 
the number one producer of such machinery in Russia being an American firm, International Harvester. The electrical construction industry in Russia was dominated by German firms, though a French subsidiary of Westinghouse was also significant. The pattern, as well as magnitude, of foreign economic activity in Russia provides clues to the sources of Russian economic backwardness. The foreigners specialized in providing what the Russians most lacked, technical and scientific skills, efficient and honest management, and to a secondary extent, capital. Russian managers were notorious for their inefficiency and corruption. A French observer in 1904 referred to the extraordinary waste, to be polite, that reigns among Russian administrators. Even after trained Russians began to emerge over the years into increasingly responsible positions, foreign firms were careful not to use Russian accountants. This business corruption mirrored a pervasive corruption in the Tsarist government, which was by no means stamped out under the Communists or in the post-Soviet era. The scientific and technological superiority of foreign firms was based largely on their copying in Russia the latest advances already in use in Western Europe. While much capital flowed in from Western Europe, there was also much capital raised within Russia itself, which had its wealthy classes, even though the masses of Russians were very poor. Lack of capital was not the source of Russian backwardness. Lack of entrepreneurship and technology were the crucial problems. Once sound and reliable management could be found, and Western technology applied, large amounts of capital could be raised from Russians, as well as from Western European investors. While the foreign-owned firms were new to Russia, they were not untried pioneers, but usually affiliates, subsidiaries, or offshoots of firms with well-established reputations and long years of experience in Western Europe or the United States. It was the reliability of the managements that made the raising of vast amounts of capital possible from both inside and outside Russia. The proportion of foreign capital in major Russian industries was just under one-half in 1900, up from one-fourth in 1890, even though the industries themselves were largely created by foreign entrepreneurs. In short, even at the height of foreign domination of Russian industry, most of the capital was Russian, and very little of it was supplied by the Tsarist government. What was lacking in Russia was not capital, but the ability to use capital. That is what the foreigners provided. Seldom were the foreign-owned firms in Russia's wholly-owned subsidiaries established with the foreign firm's existing capital. Russian capital and some Russian directors or managers were more common, though the foreign management usually retained controlling interest, even if this was less than 50%. The foreigners tended to handle what they were best at doing, internal management of the firm and assessments of technological and market possibilities. The Russian members often proved to be very useful in external relations, especially with corrupt government officials and with shrewd and scheming Russian elements with which the firm had commercial contacts. Foreign managers, unfamiliar with Russian ways, often met disaster in such external dealings. The managing of Russian labor was another large and growing problem for foreign entrepreneurs. The difficulty was not simply that the Russian workers were unskilled and unable to handle advanced Western equipment effectively, though these were factors that made the apparently cheap Russian labor costly in practice. Russian workers, often unused to the routine and rhythm of industrial life, tended to be transient or prone to absenteeism, in a word, unreliable. These problems were at their worst at the beginning, and in industries whose inherent work demands could not tolerate such behavior. When the steel industry was established in southern Russia, for example, almost all the steel workers were imported. However, the enormous costs of attracting workers from Western Europe, with wages high enough to compensate them for moving and for the dreary life in Russia, led to attempts to train and retrain Russian workers instead, wherever possible. Foreign workers were therefore a short-term expedient in the initial stages. Nevertheless, the resort to such expedients was indicative of another element of historic Russian economic backwardness. It was also difficult to get Russians to work well with foreigners. While work skills and experience would come to the Russian workers with the passing years, their hostility to foreigners would in many cases also grow, 
fanned by the rising radical movements that would culminate in the revolutions of 1917. In the short run, the resentments of the Russian workers toward foreigners sped up the Russification of the workforce in order to reduce a source of internal friction. These frictions were by no means incidental matters. In 1900, for example, rioting Russian workers burned the dwellings and belongings of sixty Belgian workers at a glass factory, causing them to flee back to Belgium. A report of a French firm in Russia in 1907 declared, One must remember that the mass of workers has been heavily indoctrinated in these last years, and their nationalism has been overexcited. The consecutive assassinations of several plant managers have shown this all too clearly. In short, the same bitter resentments directed at more productive and more prosperous domestic minorities, such as the Germans and the Jews, extended to foreigners as well. Ironically, hostility to foreign exploitation was rising just as the return on foreign investments was declining sharply, as a result of growing competition created by the inflow of more foreign businesses. Initially very high rates of return, 17.5% in 1895, dropped under 10% by 1898, under 5% in 1990, and under 3% by 1906. The prices of steel products, crucial to industrialization, also dropped sharply during this period, as Russia became self-sufficient in this basic industry due to the hated foreigners in their midst. The large role of foreigners in Russian economic development did not end with the Tsarist regime. Only a few years after seizing power, years marked by numerous economic setbacks and catastrophes, the Communists, too, turned to the West for management, engineering, and technical personnel, as well as for equipment and capital. Much effort and time were required merely to restore the economy to where it had been under the Tsars. As of 1920, Russian production of cast iron was less than 3% of what it was in 1913, and was in fact less than it had been in 1718 under Peter the Great. Similarly, Soviet production in the early 1920s was well below that of Tsarist times in platinum, agricultural implements, steam locomotives, heavy electrical equipment, tar, ammonia, and dyes, among other products. Although Tsarist Russia had such entrepreneurial pioneers of early aviation as Igor Sikorsky and Alexander P. de Seversky, both moved to the United States after the Bolshevik Revolution and contributed in a major way to the development of the American aircraft industry, while the Soviets became dependent on foreigners for the design and production of their own aircraft, military and civilian, and remained so a decade after the Revolution. A massive inflow of foreign management, engineering, and technical personnel and capital restored vast areas of the Soviet economy. For example, Although Russia under the Tsars had been the world's largest producer and exporter of oil, by 1921 Russia's oil drilling was less than 1% of what it had been at the turn of the century. An American company then began drilling oil wells in the Caucasus during the 1920s, while the Japanese were developing oil production for the Soviets in the Far East, on Sakhalin Island. Oil refineries were built by British, German, and American companies. The production of crude oil almost tripled from 1923 to 1928, as foreigners not only restored the industry, but also introduced more advanced technology. Much the same story unfolded in other sectors of the Soviet economy. The average monthly output of coal under Soviet management jumped immediately by more than 50% under American management, and the output of sawmills jumped by 75%. Such well-known German firms as Krupp and IG Farben also played major roles, as did such American firms as Ford, DuPont, RCA, and International Harvester. But many other countries were involved as well. Ball bearings came from Sweden and Italy, plastics and aircraft from France, turbines and other electrical industry technology from Britain. This influx of foreign personnel, equipment, and capital did not end with the restoration of the Soviet economy in the 1920s. Much of Stalin's building of socialism in the early five-year plans was in fact done by capitalists from Europe and America. As late as 1936, the Soviets reported about 6,800 foreign specialists at work in heavy industry alone, about one-fourth of them American engineers. 
The largest project in Stalin's first five-year plan was a steel mill designed by American engineers and based on a steel mill in Gary, Indiana. Soviet iron and steel construction in general, during the period from 1928 through 1932, was of American design, built under the supervision of American and some German engineers, using equipment from the United States and Germany. Until 1930, the Soviet automobile industry produced only a Fiat truck from Tsarist times. The first new automobile factory under the communist regime was built by the Ford Motor Company in the early 1930s and was modeled after Ford's famous River Rouge plant. When the Soviets built the largest tractor plant in Europe, it was manufactured in the United States and later assembled in the USSR under the supervision of American engineers. W. Averill Harriman reported to the U.S. Department of State in 1944 that Stalin had said in a conversation that about two-thirds of all the large industrial enterprises in the Soviet Union had been built with United States help or technical assistance. Nevertheless, the dramatic restoration and advancement of the Soviet economy was seen by many, including many in the Western democracies, as a vindication of socialist planning in general and the communist economic system in particular.